Good morning. Let me get everybody to come in and sit down. We're going to get started uh, almost immediately. First, let's uh, welcome our two other guests. Come on, Van. You all know Van Jones and Melissa Harris Perry. My name is Robert Borsage, and I'm here to greet you and welcome you to this Take Back the American Dream Summit. This will be an amazing few days. You are activists and leaders from across the country and across the progressive movement, over 1,000 strong by registration. We offer a stunning lineup of speakers and strategy sessions that await you. We will highlight the organizing that's being done to try to elect progressives who will fight for the 99%. We will share strategies on how to drive critical issues into this election, and we will give our major focus to the independent progressive movement we are building to try to take back the American dream. The days will be intense because the stakes are high. Now, I'm old enough in an election season to know that every election, people say, well, this election's the most important of our lifetime. But I think the stake these days is something more than one election. We are, I suggest to you, at the beginning of what will be a fierce struggle, already is, about what comes after a 30-year failed experiment of a conservative era, an era that has left us with extreme inequality, a declining middle class, rising poverty, the worst recession since the Great Depression, and an economy that doesn't work for working people even when it is growing. Americans clearly are casting about for change. You saw the elections in 06 and the extraordinary election in 08 as they looked for someone who could help transform America. We saw the reaction and the frustration in 2010. The uprisings of the Tea Party and of Occupy Wall Street the assault on worker rights and women's rights and the right to vote, and the mobilizations to counter that. And now we see brazen, brazen billionaires, the Koch brothers, Edelman, the super PACs, looking to consolidate complete control at all levels of government. In this situation, we ought to be perfectly clear. We are not going to allow Mitt Romney, the modern-day robber barons, and their Tea Party allies to take over in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> but we can't stop there. If we're going to build a foundation for shared prosperity, we can't accept mass unemployment as the new normal. We can't accept declining wages and increasing insecurity as inevitable. We are not signing on to a grand bargain partisan or bipartisan or transpartisan that uses the current crisis to savage the vulnerable and the elderly. If we are going to build a new start for this economy to save the American dream, we have to build an independent progressive movement, one that is prepared to take on big money politics, confront the entrenched interests that now endanger our future, and rebuild the American dream. I want to say a few words about each of these. It's now four years since Wall Street's excesses blew up this economy. Nine million jobs lost. The typical family lost a staggering 40% of their wealth, mostly in the declining value of homes. Any recovery from that kind of collapse would have been long and difficult. But this was made even more difficult by two major factors. First, there was no healthy economy to return to. 
Working families have been work losing ground for decades. Over the Bush years, most Americans suffered declining incomes and rising insecurity, even when the economy was growing. We were hemorrhaging manufacturing jobs and running up record trade deficits. Finance was capturing 40% of corporate profits while inflating the housing bubble. We waged two wars on a national credit card. We were in denial about global warming. There was no place to recover to. But in addition to that, any reforms faced fierce resistance. Now, we all know about Republican obstruction. From day one, they set out to pursue what Mitch McConnell, their leader in the Senate, called the single most important thing we want to achieve, quote and unquote. And that was ensuring that Barack Obama would be a one-term president. But when Obama pushed even modest reforms, vital to our future, on financial reform, on health care, on the recovery, on new energy, far more impressive than Republican obstruction was the power of entrenched corporate interests that mobilized legions of lobbyists to protect their privileges and their subsidies. Even when Democrats had majorities in both houses of Congress, corporate lobbies succeeded in delaying, diluting, and in some cases, defeating reform. Now, the, recover the economy is said to be in recovery, but it is the old economy that is coming back. The top 1% captured fully 93% of the income growth in 2010. That doesn't leave a lot for the rest of us. We're back to casino finance with the too big to fail banks, bigger and more concentrated forever than ever, and making big bets, as JP Morgan just showed us, in losing $3 billion on one reckless training scheme. We're back to trade deficits over a billion and a half a day. And we face the struggle of what comes next. Now, Americans are only learning about Mitt Romney, but he's not a mystery. He is, quite inevitably, of, by, and for the 1%. The big money decided to be safe, they better pick one of their own. And his agenda is a clear commitment to double down on the policies that got us in the hole we're in. He would give millionaires an average 25% tax cut on top of the Bush tax cuts. He calls for eliminating taxes on corporate profits earned abroad, turning the entire world into an offshore tax haven. He wants to deregulate Wall Street and reopen the casino economy that blew up the economy. He'd repeal health care reform, end Medicare as we know it, gut Medicaid, and throw about 34 million people out of health care protection. He defends subsidies to big oil, denies the threat posed by global warming, wants more money for the military and less for our schools. This guy is building a summer home with elevators for his cars, and he says Obama is out of touch. He paid a tax rate of about 15% on an income in one year for 20, on tw of $20 million, a lower rate than his chauffeur. But that's the tax return he chose to show us. Imagine what's in the ones that he keeps secret. No wonder he says that talking about inequality is the politics of envy and should only be done in, quote, quiet rooms. Are you kidding me? We're not going to let the brazen billionaires elect this guy president. <clears throat> he's not offering a remedy. He's offering potions that are simply poison for the middle class and the American dream. So we're going to work to reelect the president and to take back the House. But that is not enough. We have a bigger battle for America's future. Conservative columnist David Brooks says that Republicans are extreme because they are fearful that the welfare state is unaffordable and it now threatens our future. Well, we agree. We can't go back to the old state, to the old path. But they've got the, the victims wrong and the culprits wrong. It's not the poor who rig the rules and pockets millions in subsidies and privileges. It's not the elderly who blew up the economy. It's not the young who pay for the revolving door of lobbyists and officials. You want to build sustainable growth that works for working people, it's not enough to put Obama in the White House or Nancy Pelosi in the Speaker's chair. 
We have to take on crony capitalism, the entrenched interests, the big money that corrupt politicians in both parties. <clears throat> Look at the sources of our current debt. Half of our deficit comes from the economic collapse that came when Wall Street blew up the economy. Next comes the Bush tax cuts and tax loopholes that have millionaires paying lower taxes than their secretaries and big corporations paying no taxes at all in some cases. And then the continued costs of a bloated military and the two wars. Turn to the scary long-term projections, you've all seen maps of them, that make it look like America's going broke. These are entirely the question of soaring health care costs, an unaffordable health care system deformed by powerful health insurance, hospital and drug companies, complexes that hike costs so that Americans pay twice per capita what other citizens in other industrial countries pay for worse health care results. To revive the American dream, we have to take on the powerful that profit from these arrangements, not the vulnerable who are their victims. So this is not a question for one president, one election, one administration. We're about to head into what they call the grand bargain. I think. <laughs> right after the election, we hit a fiscal train wreck purely made by the politicians in Washington. And it's being used as an excuse, an excuse to cut a grand bargain. Shared sacrifice is necessary, we're told. It's time to put our books in order. Let's do a big trade. Let's trade cuts in Social Security and Medicare for tax reform that lowers rates, closes loopholes, and gives us more revenue. This ought to be known instead of the grand bargain as the big heist. <clears throat> But be clear about what it means. What it means is that we accept mass unemployment as normal, because we're going to turn to balancing our budgets rather than focus on creating jobs. It means that middle class Americans and the vulnerable will get stuck with much of the bill for the mess that Wall Street created. And worse, in some ways, it ignores largely the causes of the plight we face. The wealthy will still not pay their fair share of taxes. Wall Street will still be free to blow up the economy. The insurance co and drug companies will still drive up health care costs. We will still not have our long-term budgets under control. So we have to organize now to oppose, to oppose the big heist and demand the real deal. And the pieces of this are simple. We need good jobs now and good jobs first before we turn to austerity. And we have got to focus on what drives our deficits, the big money interests that now are deforming our government. <clears throat> this won't be easy. We have to build an independent capacity to elect people's champions and hold them accountable. We'll talk about that at this conference. We need to make big money toxic in this election, even as we work to overturn Citizens United and get money out of politics. We need direct action, nonviolent confrontations, demonstrations that expose and challenge the interests standing in the way. This is a forbidding task. It is the great challenge of democracy. Can the people, in fact, curb the rapaciousness of big money and big power? But we've been in this situation before. At the end of the 19th century, the robber barons consolidated oligopolies and in major industries. Politicians were routinely bought or rented. Labor unions were outlawed. But populist movements, progressive reformers, labor uh, uprisings challenged the supremacy of that unassailable power. It took decades of struggle. But eventually, that people's movement won. The extremes of inequality were reduced, the brazen corruption curbed, and what made America special, exceptional, the broad middle class was built. And now we are back 
to that same kind of inequality, that same kind of robber baron money politics. And once more, the test is posed. Can we, can the many, overcome the power of the few? And what's exciting is we've seen the first stirrings in Wisconsin and Ohio and Occupy Wall Street, which spread across the country like wildfire. <clears throat> we must continue to build, serious about taking power, serious about rebuilding the country, understanding we'll, we'll suffer setbacks, fierce in opposition to the modern robber baron politics, not satisfied with the defense of what is. Sure, we will try to work to defeat Romney and the right. We'll push to take back the House, but we will keep on building an independent movement to take back the American dream. That's our subject this week. That's our task for the years to come. We know it isn't going to be easy. We know it can be done. Si se puede. Yes, we can. <clears throat> Now I'm delighted to introduce Melissa Harris Perry. She is a modern Wonder Woman. She is a, Dr. Perry is a, is a professor of political science at Tulane University. She's the author of Sister Citizen, Shame Stereotypes and Black Women in America. She's a regular columnist for The Nation magazine. And she's the host of her own show on, on MSNBC that airs on Saturday and Sunday mornings. She's the proud mother of a young daughter, and once a month or so, she gets a little sleep. It's a delight to introduce you to Melissa Harris Perry. Good morning. So it's the, it's the start of what is going to be um, an ideologically diverse day for me today. Um, I'm going to run off the stage when I am uh, done with my address because I am heading off to Chicago where I will join the Bush family for a conversation about volunteerism in America. So <laughs> that'll be fun. Um, by the end of the day, I will have no idea um, what's going on uh, in the world, but I am very happy to start the day with you and particularly um, because because what I find um, to be my value added within the public sphere is not as, uh, not as an activist or an organizer per se. I am married to an activist and an organizer, and so it's very clear to me which one of us does real work and which one of us talks about the real work that needs to get done in the world. Um, and, and so that is probably not my comparative advantage. I hope today to to do a little bit of what I think my comparative advantage is, which is to try to understand analytically where we are and how we got here. So I'm so appreciative of the framework of thinking about this within a historical context, the kind of robber baron moment. And I want to really take a, a much shorter historical context, really just the past decade. And rather than focusing primarily on what the elites have been up to, to think a little bit about how where we are now has been made possible by the choices that we as ordinary citizens and Americans made. Because we were not fully disempowered in these moments, we made many choices. So I want to start with the moment that is September 11, 2001. Because I believe that the era that we are in now begins on September 11, 2001. The election of George W. Bush in 2000 whatever we think about it, is an election that ultimately was a choice that the American people made about... Okay, that's not... Okay. Okay, that's fine. That's, that was all fine. I, I had a little... I've been reading The Hunger Games. I suddenly thought I needed to duck or something. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even kidding. I really was running through my head what, what kind of um, thing the Capitol might have been sending uh, to us in this moment. 
So September, September 11, 2001, my, um, my sense here is that when we elected George W. Bush or when George W. Bush was, was handed the American presidency by the Supreme Court of the United States, that, that that decision was made in part because we understood ourselves to be in a, a time of peace internationally, of domestic economic growth. And George W. Bush, for whatever failings or successes he has, does seem like a guy to kind of keep the party going. Right? So if you're thinking that you're coming out of the Clinton era and things are good economically and we're at peace internationally, then it does not seem that odd to make the choice of electing a kinder, gentler conservative. Right? You got to go back to 2000 to remember where we were in that moment. We did not know then that just a few months into the first year of George W. Bush's presidency that it would no longer be the good times, it would no longer be a time of economic expansion, it would no longer be a time of relative international peace, but instead that the new era would begin when Americans finally came into where many of our trading partners, political partners and allies had been for decades, which is into the age of contemporary terrorism. Americans, of course, responded in very typically American ways to that entree into something that many people in the rest of the world had already experienced. We began with a kind of nationalist fervor that was justified as reasonable patriotism. I like to point out that we clearly must have been having post-traumatic stress disorder because for about a year after September 11th, there were African-American men walking around the city of New York with NYPD hats on. That can only be explained as a PTSD response. But I know, we'll just let, that, let you sit with that for a minute. But the other thing that happens in that moment, I don't want to miss this, is that a new version of what America typically needs emerge, and that is a racial enemy. Americans, in part, identify who we are and who deserves what through our notions of whiteness and of the racial enemies that are the non-whites. And in this moment, the new racial enemy became not so much Reagan's welfare queen who was imaginary, but instead this imagined other that is somehow Muslim or Arab or Sikh or something else. We became willing to stomach a kind of horrific racial violence in the name of national security. It's something that we have been willing to stomach as a people over and over again in our history. The Patriot Act was not an act of a Republican president acting alone. The Patriot Act was a bipartisan decision by both parties. It was not bought and paid for by corporations. It was bought and paid for by our fear. As much as we have our eyes on the Citizens United decision, we have to remember that it was our collective angst, maybe not the people in this room, but our collective angst that gave permission to Democrats in the House to rally behind Republicans in the White House under the banner of nationalist patriotic security with the goal of both reducing our domestic civil liberties and giving us an entrance into what is at this moment an everlasting war. We made those choices. So if that was September 11th, 2001, interesting thing happens a few years later. The Democrats need to run a presidential candidate and it turns out Democrats are really very bad at one thing. Well, actually, a couple of things. But one, one thing in particular, and one of the things that we're very, very bad at, is trying to think about what kind of Democrat Republicans will vote for. Right? This is our like, predictive ability thing. It's, it's really the only reason that we ended up with um, candidate Obama is because we were in an open seat race. And so we didn't really know who we were running against. So we just got all like, free with our actual preferences and ended up with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama as our final two. We never would have made those choices had we been running against an incumbent. We undoubtedly would have picked John Edwards. Let's just be honest about that. <laughs> But in 2004, we chose what we thought would be the good moderate candidate 
one that would get Republican votes, and that, of course, was John Kerry, who showed up at the 2004 DNC and saluted and said, reporting for duty. We did not, in the fall of 2004, launch as a Democratic Party an attempt to push back against the war effort. Quite the opposite, Democrats decided to run a soldier under the banner, under the idea that he could do even better at the war machine. So what changed then? What changed it? August 29, 2005. August 29, 2005 is the day that the levees failed in the city of New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Maybe it's actually not that day because on that day and on the five subsequent days immediately after the levees failed and the city flooded, we behaved just as we did in the immediate post 9-11 moment. We got scared of our racial enemies. The governor of Louisiana, a Democrat, the mayor of the city of New Orleans, a black Democrat, jointly decided to suspend search and rescue efforts in order to focus on law and order. Until, until the national media recognized that there were people, not people actually, women, elderly, and children starving and dying in the city center. It wasn't until the images of African-American women, the elderly, and children who were dehydrating in the heat of a New Orleans August finally turned the language away from this kind of law and order language and into what the economists called the shaming of America. I don't know if you remember this, but I'm looking at the image right now that if I'd gotten myself together, I would have put up as a PowerPoint. But it's the image of The Economist magazine the second week of September 2005, an African-American woman is on the cover. She's wearing a New Orleans t-shirt and it says, the shaming of America. I'd like you to pause and ask yourself, how many black women have appeared on the cover of The Economist magazine? And I don't know her name. I live in New Orleans, I study Katrina, and I don't know her name. And yet there are very, very few black women who ever have appeared. She may be, maybe Condi, ever, maybe. And yet the notion that there was still a collective shaming that happens in a country that fancies itself a place where women and children are first, Hurricane Katrina actually shames us into an anti-war stance. And here's how it goes. From September 11th, 2001 until about September 4th, I'm going to give it, of 2005, we are trying to participate in the nationalist patriotic fervor against the imagined racial enemy that is those others over there that are activating terrorism against us, right until the levees fail, we realize that we've allowed our own citizens to drown, to die, and to dehydrate on camera. And we go, oh, if you can't get a water to an American city for a week, how can you prosecute a foreign war? And the Democratic Party feels a little steel drop down its spine. All these media folks who live in New York City who realize that if this is how we respond to disasters, they're screwed. And for the first time, we start hearing an active anti-war message, not from the people, but from the people that is then resonated up through a left party. This, of course, is how, in 2006, Democrats win back the House. They win the House in 2006 because for the first time they articulate an actual paradigm difference to the Republican Party for the first time in five years. And we, of course we remember the response to the anti-war message that won the midterm elections in 2006. You guys remember what happened? The surge. Right? The response to the American people saying we want out of the war is that the White House sent more soldiers into the war. It is exactly the opposite of what happens in 2010 when by taking over the House, the Republican Party decides that it has a mandate from the American people to turn back what they had just done in 2008. This White House in 2006 told us we don't care what just happened in the midterms. We are running this war effort and we let them. Except that 
Of course, we know what happened then right after that. It's a young guy. He was a state senator in Illinois. He'd managed to make it in to the U.S. Senate, really only because the Republican Party in Illinois was in such shambles that their decision for a candidate to run against him was Alan Keyes. And on a Wednesday, I could probably beat Alan Keyes for almost any race. Now, this is not to say that State Senator Barack Obama is anything short of exceptional, but the ease with which he walked into the U.S. Senate had everything to do with the failures of Judy Parr, Topinka, and the Illinois Republican Party. Thanks, Judy. We appreciate that. In the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the national figure that emerges is Barack Obama on one hand, Hillary Clinton on the other, and a sense among the American people that what we had just done and what we had been doing since 2001 was not the best of who we were, that we were capable of something else. I loved the 2008 campaign. It was great fun. It was. It just was, that 2008 campaign. Great fun. But it wasn't great fun because the Obama for America campaign was so brilliant. They were fine. It was great fun because of the freelancing that went on. Remember, I'm trying to tell a story here about the people. Remember the freelancing that went on? So here Barack Obama goes and he does this amazing thing in New Hampshire. He loses and then gives a victory speech, which takes real gumption, right? He loses in New Hampshire and he's like, screw it. I'm going to give Yes We Can anyway, right? Stands up and gives Yes We Can. It's an amazing moment. Everyone's like, wow, that, that's hot. And then we walk away until a week later, and what happens? Will I Am remixes Yes We Can. When you think about why Yes We Can matters, it's not because of Barack Obama giving it, as great as it was. It's because Will I Am remixed it, and then you posted it on your Facebook wall, and then you sent it around, and then you emailed it, and then it became viral. The excitement of the 2008 campaign was the way in which freelancing and technology and ordinary people decided that what we had been doing since September 11, 2001 was no longer the best of who we were and how the 2008 campaign might provide an opportunity for us to indicate the best of who we were, the exceptionalism that we defined as what made us exceptional, our willingness to think about either a white woman or a black guy, that's cool. The response from the right was a kind of anxiety about what that meant. A willingness to pull us back into what we had been doing for the years before. So that once President Obama is elected, the language is that he is a secret Muslim. Of course he's a secret Muslim because remember, September 11, 2001, our new racial enemy becomes the Muslims. You know, of course, you can't be a secret Muslim. You can be a secret Christian, can't be a secret Muslim. It's just a different kind of religion. Like, you know, Christian, all you got to do is be like, I love Jesus. He's in my heart. And then you can just be a Christian. And you can just do that secretly. But like, if you're a Muslim, there are certain kinds of practices that you have to do. So you can't like secretly be one. It's just not how it works. You would notice him praying five times a day. Think you cannot be a secret Muslim. Okay. But along with that anxiety around this kind of secret outsider, and I'm, I'm, I'll go very quickly here, I promise, there's also a revival of the anti-immigrant panic. And we are as much on the left to blame for failing to recognize and stem this at the moment that it occurred. Do you remember the Joe Wilson moment? President Obama speaking, Joe Wilson stands up and says, you lie, the, the left freaks out. It's racism! Black man speaking, white guy from former Confederate state says you lie, why black man speaking, that looks like ordinary old-fashioned racism. But don't forget this, President Obama, when he was speaking in that moment, was talking about the health care reform bill and he said, when this passes, don't worry, illegals will not be allowed to partake in the health care reform that we are passing. And then Joe Wilson stood up and said you lie. So the president was in that moment actually drawing a bright line, a boundary between citizens and non-citizens on this issue of a fundamental human right, health care reform, before 
Joe Wilson stands up and says you lie. So the, the terrain there is multiple levels. Yes, there's probably some of that old-fashioned Jim Crow racism, but there's also this brand new anti-immigration panic. Notice that this week, when the president was again interrupted by a journalist in the Rose Garden, that that interruption came when he was talking about immigration. That laying on of our anxieties is about this new fear, this old fear, and mixed together with American racism. But then, of course, there's plenty of old-fashioned American racism going on still among us as people, again, not talking about the elites. But the shoot-to-kill laws that took Trayvon Martin's life are the same shoot-to-kill laws that were enacted in the days immediately following Hurricane Katrina, that are based in our same great fear that emerged immediately post-September 11th. This kind of vilification of bodies that we assume to be criminal. Lay on top of all of that, the war on women, a war on women that I noticed was occurring for the first, I wasn't sure it was coming, but I started seeing it when President Obama nominated Sonia Sotomayor to the Supreme Court. If you can take yourself back and remember the gauntlet that she was forced to walk through those Senate confirmation hearings, like just for fun, for kicks and giggles this afternoon. Watch the Jamie Dimon testimony right next to the Sonia Sotomayor confirmation hearings. Just, just watch them. Right after Sonia Sotomayor was put through what I like to call a kind of Elizabeth Eckford moment. Remember, Elizabeth Eckford is the girl the teenage girl who was forced to walk that gauntlet in Little Rock with the screaming, yelling faces behind her, so much like what I saw when I was watching Sonia Sotomayor. Right after that, we then have the vilification of Shirley Sherrard. Now, I, I want to point out here, on this one I'm not making a, a critique of the administration, I'm actually making a critique of the NAACP an organization that I think has been doing extraordinary and exceptional work, especially recently, but who in that moment when Shirley Sherrard was first presented to the American people by Andrew Breitbart as a racist, the leadership of the NAACP initially, although they came around pretty quickly, but initially saying she should be ashamed of herself for her comments. Now that had to have happened because they just didn't know who Shirley Sherrard was. And see, that's fine if you didn't know who Shirley Sherrard was, maybe it's even okay if I don't know, although I did. But if you have ever watched Eyes on the Prize, which I assume anyone who is in the leadership of the NAACP did, then the name Sherrard and the state of Georgia should have sort of rung a bell for you because you know Charles Sherrard and Shirley Sherrard sort of liberated the rest of Georgia while King was taking care of Atlanta. But that willingness to see a rural black woman from Georgia as inherently expendable. And then, of course, post-2010, the full assault on women through the personhood amendments, through the fight between Komen and Planned Parenthood, through putting contraception on the agenda in the 21st century. Like, it, I'm sorry, it, it's horrible, but it, just, it really, you have to laugh. Like, seriously, we are talking about the pill in 2012. The outlawing of abortions that never actually occur. Telling Sandra Fluke that she has to basically defend against being a slut in order to speak to the American people as though we are in Egypt and she has to submit to a virginity test in order to be in the public sphere. Oh yeah, and by the way, that 2010 year of the GOP woman is the first year that we actually lost ground in the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate in terms of women's representation in more than 30 years. We did that. And when I say we, I just mean the American people in the broadest sense. That our fear, our anxiety, our willingness to frame others, whether they are unruly women, illegal immigrants, lazy black people, terrorist Muslims, our willingness to not see ourselves in them, but to see them as the other, make possible all of these policy moments. And this is the last thing I will say, and then I will run from this building. 
There is no reason to lose hope. We are just not a perfect people. We're just not. We're kind of like an adolescent country. We sort of remember adolescence. My daughter is almost 11. I had forgotten. Adolescence is hard. You just randomly feel bad and get afraid and wonder about the security of childhood that you once had, and particularly for a country that became so dominant so quickly, that became so wealthy in the context of such inequality, that understood itself as standing on a shining hill. We are in our adolescence and we're making a bit of a mess of it. That said, there is no reason to lose hope. The fear that has activated the past decade cannot be countered with more fear of what is coming. Is there money in the political system? Yup. Is the Supreme Court friendly? Nope. Are there folks willing to actually damage the very core of our democratic principles in order to win short-term gains? Mm-hmm. Are people gonna, yep. Maybe it's coming from people who were slaves and Mormons. My white people were Mormons. My black people were slaves. Everybody was basically after them. The Mormons got ejected out of Missouri and had to push handcarts across the American West. The black folks got enslaved for a couple of centuries. I don't know. I guess struggle doesn't worry me in the sense of being struggle itself. What I do know is that my enslaved grandmother who was sold on a street corner in Richmond, Virginia, believed in God. Now I'm not asking you to believe in God, I'm asking you to think about this. This is a woman who never knew anything but slavery for herself. Never knew anything but slavery for everyone she'd ever been related to. Never expected anything but slavery for all the people who she would be related to in the future. There was no empirical evidence that any being cared about her circumstances. There was no empirical evidence that there was a loving God that had any power. I mean, if there was a loving God, he was pretty pitiful. Or if he was powerful, he didn't seem to love her. I'm not asking you to believe in God or to accept any sort of supreme being. I'm asking you to think about the faith that is associated with the hope that is not necessarily rooted in the empirical realities that you see around you right at this moment. That says that we can still be part of something that is bigger than ourselves and something that we cannot necessarily see at this moment, but simply requires us not to be afraid of each other. Because it is our fear of each other It's our fear of each other that makes us exceptionally easy to divide. And so I promise I'm leaving, I'm leaving. But I will just say this. I know I talk to a lot, I really am. I'm gonna go off and talk to the Bushes now, but it's because I'm not afraid of them. Sometimes I'm angry with them. I often disagree, but I am not afraid of any person with whom we are struggling. We can get to another place. There's no reason to lose hope. Melissa Harris Perry. And she is literally running to make that airplane. All right, we're gonna leave you with one final speaker this morning. You all know Van Jones, I assume. He's a uh, public school boy grew up to be a graduate of Yale Law School. But I like to tease him and tell him that he rose above it. He's the co-founder of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, co-founder of Color for Change, co-founder for Green for All. We joined him in launching his new venture, Rebuild the American Dream, an extraordinary innovative effort to restore good jobs and economic opportunity and to build the movement necessary to make that happen. He has neither amassed a great personal fortune, 
He has not held an elected public office, and yet Time Magazine has named him one of the world's 100 most influential people. Give it up for Van Jones. Melissa kind of bad. Give another round of applause for Melissa. Harris Perry. Tell you what, um, I love getting up uh, when I can and seeing her on television. She doesn't just speak that way with that much clarity, that much insight, uh, that much courage to us. She gets a chance to speak that way to the whole of the American people uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. And I think that that is a part of what I want to talk about today, the voice uh, that's been missing. Uh, the voice that's been missing. Um, Rodney King uh, passed away over this weekend. And it's hard for me to imagine that it's been 20 years since he became a household wor a word, a household name on planet Earth. Just a regular brother with a lot of regular brother problems and regular brother issues uh, put in a situation, unfortunately, that's all too common. The only difference was it was caught on camera. We know what happened with the verdicts, we know what happened with the uprising, but we sometimes don't think about what it must have been like for him to get pushed out in front of television cameras, uh, no speech in hand, no pollsters, uh, with the whole world watching, and to have to speak from his true heart. A lot of things about his life that uh, you could easily dismiss him and discount him for, but in those moments, who you really are comes through. And he just said five words. And they're the same five words that I think Melissa tries to bring us back around to. Can we all get along? A, 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 a prayer, a plea for some kind of sanity to emerge from the catastrophe that was unfolding all around him. For some kind of wisdom, some kind of higher purpose to somehow be pulled from the mess, to be pulled from the wreckage of America. Can we all get along? He went on with his life. He did good things. He did bad things. He did things he regretted. And he passed away. But I think his question still resounds. Can we all get along? We have this extraordinary moment now. As we look at November and the months beyond, who are we as a country? in this mess, in this catastrophe? Are we going to turn to each other or are we going to turn on each other? That is a great moment, the great question that the world is now looking at us to answer. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Perry for pointing out that it's not just about the corporations, it's about us here in this room. So we have a responsibility uh, some people felt uh, that uh, four years ago we were too emotional. We made decisions too emotionally. Uh, and then we, we just got a little bit uh, dope on hope or whatever. We got doped up on the hopey stuff. Uh, and we just got too hopey. And we got too emotional. And we weren't thinking clearly. And so we want to have a reaction against that. And now it seems that uh, I'm watching as this moment of testing for America uh, emerges in this year, I'm seeing the people who fought the hardest uh, in the decade that Dr. Perry just talked about now fighting the least. I'm seeing a movement that was built up over that decade that stood up against Bush, that stood up against Roe, that stood up against Cheney, that stood up against torture, that stood up against war, that stood up for the people in, who were suffering in Katrina, who saw African-American mothers and grandmothers on rooftops and whose hearts were broken to see people drowning, to see an American city drowning and who stood up 
at that time when there was nothing in Washington, D.C. that would answer the call and who insisted that we go in a better way. I'm watching that movement that broke the back of Karl Rove's stranglehold on our Congress, who elected the first African-American president. I'm watching that movement that inspired the world, that shocked the world, that stunned the world. In the moment of maximum peril now, sit down. There are people in this country who are drowning on dry land. They're drowning economically on dry land. They need a movement that is willing to stand with them. And yet, and yet, there is this reluctance. We saw in Wisconsin what happens when we put our minimum against our opponent's maximum. Uh, the people in Wisconsin fought be beautifully and bravely, but help was not on the way. They had to fight against 13 billionaires. Not just the people talking about the Koch brothers. No, they like the, the, the Koch basketball team. I mean, a whole squadron of billionaires, only one of whom lived in Wisconsin. Our opponents did their maximum. Most of us did our minimum. And we saw what happened. So there's a question now that falls upon this conference. Are we going to let the Tea Party govern America? Is that the kind of movement that we are? Can we not find some lessons from 2008 and 2010 that would let us move forward together? Smarter, tougher, wiser, but more determined and more committed. That innocent people whether they be the Rodney Kings of today, like Trayvon, who are victimized by racial violence, won't have to fight alone. And that the, those of us across the country who are suffering economically will not be further harmed by the outcome of the two big fights in 2012. In November, politically. In December, economically on the budget. Well, in order for us to figure out what we're going to do, we're going to have to do something I was taught to do when I was in public school. I got some education, as you mentioned. Uh, I get credit for having gone to Yale, that's true. Uh, but I wasn't born at Yale. I was born on the edge of a small town in rural West Tennessee. Uh, both my parents were public school teachers. And I had a public school teacher named Miss Brown, who was my kindergarten teacher. And whenever we were stumped, whenever she'd ask us a question that was just too hard to answer, she would say, well, now, put your thinking caps on. Did you guys have, those, have thinking caps in the budget in your public schools? <laughs> and we would put them on. <laughs> and we would think. And lo and behold, somebody would come up with the answer. Why was that? It was because we had a moment to go deep. Uh, and we had a public school teacher who cared. And I'm going to say this before I move on. Uh, maybe I was raised wrong. But in my community, in my neighborhood, in my home, I was never taught about any threat to me called the public employee. We didn't call them. We didn't call them public employees. We didn't see them as some sort of threat that needed to be turned into a political punching bag and disrespected. We didn't call them public employees. We called them teachers. We called them nurses. We called them librarians. We called them firefighters. We called them police officers. We called, they were the backbone of our community. They were our everyday heroes. We were taught to look up to them. We were taught to respect them. We were taught to say, yes, ma'am, and no, sir, to them. We, 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 and, and they never abandoned us. No, no matter how big the fire, 
no matter how heinous the crime, no matter how slow the learner, they never abandon us, not one single time. But now it's fashionable to turn on them and abandon them. We say no, we are a better country than that. We are not going to attack the people who've been there for us. We're gonna lift them up and treat them right. But let's just be smart enough to follow the advice of Ms. Brown. God bless her soul. She didn't have a big budget to draw on, but she knew how to get young people to think. She said, put your thinking caps on. Let's put our thinking caps on and reason together. There's no reason, if, if, if we were too emotional last time to, 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 to learn all the right lessons, and let's not be so emotional this time in the other direction that we do stupid stuff in the other direction. Let's put our thinking caps on. What, what can we learn from 2008? What can we learn from 2010 that will let us win, not just politically in November, but economically in December in 2012? What can we learn? What do we learn from 2008? Uh, we all know the happy part of it, but afterwards people went from hopey to mopey. People went from hope to heartbreak. What happened? Well, we didn't know enough. We thought something that was not true. We thought that we had 100% of what we needed to govern in America. We had the House with, I think, the best speaker we've ever had, Nancy Pelosi. We had the House of Representatives. We had the Senate with 60 votes. And we had President Obama. We said, listen, we have enough now to govern. But it turned out not to be true. It turned out we only had one third of what we needed to govern. It turns out you don't just need uh, formal control of the government, but you also need two other things. You have to have a movement in the streets. Uh, and we abandon the streets. You have to have a media establishment, like they have in the uh, Senate on Fox. And with us having only the government, but not having people in the streets peacefully and nonviolently, and not having a coordinated media strategy, we were checkmated by a fired up, fearful right wing, funded by, as my brother Borisaj said, brazen billionaires. And we were checkmated. Doesn't mean the administration didn't make big mistakes, we'll talk about those. But fundamentally, we did not have what we needed to be able to govern from below, even as the Democrats tried to govern from above. We, we, we had a top-down capacity that was not met by a bottom-up movement. And instead, the streets were filled not with people like us, but with people carrying signs, saying that the president, uh, comparing him to Hitler, and uh, people who were spitting on Congress people and calling them the N-word, those people took the streets and stopped our movement. So many, many people sat down in 2010. What can we learn from 2010? Because people say, well, you know, the right wing was on the march. If you look at the numbers, they didn't turn out that many more people 2010 than 2008. We just turned out a lot fewer.